So the name of our session today is Cultural Considerations in Advanced Care Planning, a new video tool, tool for caregivers and care providers. And it's my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Barbara Green, who traveled with us this morning from the Twin Cities. Barbara is Director of Community Engagement, Honoring Choices Minnesota, and initiative of the Twin Cities Medical Society. She provides direct leadership for a statewide and national advanced planning initiative. She has convened Minnesota healthcare systems, community leaders, public and private organizations, foundations, and other stakeholders to transform the process of healthcare decision making and end of life care decisions with individuals over 18 years of age. In her work with Honor Choice Minnesota, Ms. Green has developed an infrastructure and support network for ongoing community conversations, discussions, and partnerships between profit and non-profit organizations. Roles include strategic metro-wide and state planning, media relations and communications, writing and publishing in journals and press, developing outcome measures for evaluation processes and purposes, and representing the 5,000 physician member medical society and cultural communities facing secure health care disparities. And so we're thrilled to have Barbara here today, and she'll be presenting on some of the new videos that Honoring Choices Minnesota has just recently developed. So I'll turn it over to you now, Barbara. Thank you, Jim. Okay, so we're having trouble just advancing our slides here, but um, Barb will be advancing the webinar slides. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today as we're talking about cultural considerations in advanced care planning, a new video tool for caregivers and care providers. And what this webinar uh, really is going to be about today is the power of story in advanced care planning. Um, as this country approaches a powerful change in ages, and the baby boomers continues to grow older and uh, and grayer and wiser, mm -hmm. um, stories are bubbling up to the surface. And it's the stories that we are hearing as providers in all kinds of settings that are making its impact. Um, the stories have the power to really engage people and motivate them to begin advanced care planning, which is beginning the conversation about end-of-life wishes if you couldn't speak for yourself. And what we've learned both in Minnesota on a national le level is that if the conversations is what is important. Um, at some, uh, at an earlier period, people were uh, focusing more on simply completing the form, simply completing a health care directive that stated, and that often have, have checklists, the DNR and, and intubation, those days are long gone, and what we've learned is that the conversation is what is most important to bring the family, the providers, nursing homes, everyone on the same page together, and that's what we're going to talk more about today. Stories are really our cultural currency. They're what bring uh, what is happening in our lives uh, meaning and uh, exchange stories and powerful messages and values between generations. Uh, in the last uh, week, Dr. Gwande was uh, Dr. Sue Gwande was in the Twin Cities, and many people on this webinar have the pleasure of hearing him in person. And Dr. Gwande wrote in his newer book, *The Mortal*. In the end, people don't view their life as merely the average of all of its moments, which after all is mostly nothing much plus some sleep. 
A human being's life is meaningful because it simply is a story. Today we have some key obje objectives. Um, first of all, we're going to identify significant differences in approaching advanced care planning with Latino, Hispanic, Hmong, and Somali communities. We'll describe how differences in gender, age, education, and acculturation impact advanced care planning conversations. We'll explain how to best use three new videos to stimulate conversations within clinics and healthcare systems, patient homes, and community settings. And we'll also have time for um, some QA in the very end to really engage and answer uh, questions pose really important considerations as well. Honoring Choices Minnesota is a huge statewide Minnesota initiative that began in 2008 by several local physicians. And the intent was to really engage communities and physicians and providers in a death care planning conversation in a comfortable and, and culturally sensitive way. Since then, the initiative has grown and grown until now we also have a national presence and um, work with 11 other states, including Alaska, Hawaii, Wisconsin, Florida, Washington State, and others, uh, so that we can share resources and best practices in advanced care planning. And so this large-scale initiative, really the goal is to increase the conversations involving patients, providers, and the community at large. Uh, this is a very powerful, collaborative, non-competitive approach. Um, many health systems that at one time were fiercely competitive have learned to come together in annual meetings and, um, and in conversations in a completely non-competitive basis. So we are involving all kinds of systems, um, large systems, small hospitals, uh, nursing homes, a whole variety of organizations collaboratively. Again, hundreds of healthcare leaders, community partners, ambassadors who are volunteers and other representatives are part of the statewide initiative. Uh, we're based currently in the Twin Cities, which is part of the uh, mission of the Twin Cities Medical Society. The Medical Society is the convener for all of the stakeholders and groups that are part of this. Since the initiative began in 2008, we have over 62,000 documented health care directives in patient electronic medical records throughout both the Twin Cities and the state. <coughs> We have over 3,000 professionals and volunteers trained to speak with advanced care planning with their patients, and these are called advanced care planning facilitators. They are using the Gunderson Lutheran Medical Foundation Respecting Choices First Steps model, and this is currently how we're um, training facilitators in most of the healthcare systems. And on our website, www.honoredchoices.org, over 25,000 healthcare directives have been downloaded from this website. Uh, this website also contains more than 700 video clips and seven documentaries as well on advanced care planning. So the uh, website is designed, designed to meet the needs of many different people, many different audiences. Today, as we're approaching advanced care planning and multicultural um, approaches, uh, there's a very strong change in the cultural paradigm in advanced care planning. In talking about multicultural care, uh, a lot of people are used to seeing the words cultural competency. And in the past, cultural competency was really seen as an end product. A person would attend a couple of seminars, or it might be part of an ongoing staff requirement that you go to uh, this cultural, cultural competency workshop or another. And the truth of the matter is um, what we're really focusing on nationwide is something called cultural humility, which is quite different 
and we'll go into that in a, uh, a little while. And a little while, it, sorry, is right now. So as we're approaching it, culture of humility is more than gaining factual knowledge. It's the desire um, to repair and, and restore power imbalances where none ought to exist. Many times in the past with multicultural advanced care planning, people relied on stereotypes. And these are just a few very blatant ones that I wanted to include as an example. Um, one might be that, that all Hmongs grew up in refugee camps. Uh, for those of you that are not aware of uh, the Hmong presence, not only in Minnesota, but nationally, you know, the Hmong helped the United States government um, in the war in Vietnam. And when that war ended and the monks who had served and helped the um, U.S. forces um, were considered the e enemy, they were put into refugee camps and often uh, lived in them for very long periods of time before the U.S. government allowed Hmong into the United States as a refugee status. Um, so at one time, Hmong, most Hmong often grew up in camps. Now we have first and second generation living in the United States. We have Hmong that have never been back to Laos or Southeast Asia. We have young Hmong who are not very familiar with the Hmong language. Um, so the Hmong background has entirely changed. We have generations of Hmong growing up in Minnesota, in Wisconsin, in North Carolina, in California, in many areas. Another stereotype, for example, with Somalis is uh, all Somalis fast during Ramadan. Uh, within many cultural groups, including um, Islam, there are variations and things that are, are more complex than they seem on the, on the surface. So uh, this is just an example of a, of a stereotype that may not be true in all cases. Also, another one would be all Latino Hispanics believe in miracles. Uh, in um, much of Latino uh, Hispanic Catholicism and uh, Christianity, there has been a strong emphasis on miracles and um, intervention of God. And as you know, this occurs in many cultures, many religions, but to say that, some, that all people believe in miracles with a certain ethnicity is simply not true. In the past, many people liked recipe uh, designs to discuss values and beliefs and how this looked like was sort of put, putting people into recipe cards. All um, Jews believe this. All Baptists believe this. All Somalis believe this. And as we know, there are a great many variations both within and between cultures. So an example of a recipe-like um, way of, of thinking would be you know, all Jews are buried, not cremated, based on traditional religious beliefs. You know, at one time, most Jews in the world were based on uh, early Talmudic uh, texts, but there are, are movements to go beyond that, and in many synagogues in the United States, um, Jews are being cremated. So I bring this up simply in working with Jewish clients. Um, one cannot take for granted um, the process of burial. Uh, another example would be all Lutherans have somber funerals. Uh, this is a uh, heavily uh, Lutheran state, so I'm not going to go into the details of Lake Wolverine on this. But uh, as we know, people have many different backgrounds and traditions. And a third would be uh, most GLBT persons want their partner as their health care agent. You know, I included this because in a lot of our listening sessions uh, that the medical slide is done, um, there's, there has often been estrangement between um, gay, lesbian, bi, transgender people and their families. But um, there's also been reconciliation, and there are times when, when no uh, separation has occurred. So one never knows one's relationship with any family. So again, it's important not to look at any stereotype, but ask the right kind of questions that are appropriate for the families you're working with. There are some uh, additional common errors in approaching multicultural advanced care planning. Um, one is that often people look at racial, ethnic, and religious differences as the real differences between people or peoples. 
And often there are others that are much more significant than these. Economics has a huge impact. Class has a huge impact. One's education or, or lack of uh, creates very different values and backgrounds um, within people. Skill sets, uh, your, your values are, are, are tremendous. Um, I'm sure most of you know people of different racial or ethnic backgrounds that maybe have very similar, similar values and people who are of the same ethnicity or the same racial group or in the same state who have very different ones. So uh, it's very important to go beyond race, ethnicity, and religion um, in looking at differences between people. There are much better ways today to approach multicultural dance care planning, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about this morning. I hope you've heard of some of these, and if not, if you use friendly Google and and explore, you'll, you'll find out much more about these. And I, this is a, these are all really important resources I want to introduce you to. So one is the term cultural humility. And cultural humility really refers to lifelong evaluation of constant learning, lifelong critique, lifelong practice. Um, it, it refers to the, uh, to the belief and the value that we never arrive at a point, that there's never an end point when we're done learning. Another best practices approach is, again, to recognize that economics, education levels, access to health care, and accurate health care information have a huge impact on decision making and understanding of choices. Once again, this goes far beyond ethnicity, race, and uh, nationality. Another really important way of approaching advanced care planning is asking the right questions. And this is simply seeking to understand and never assume. I think the more people work with other people of other backgrounds, the better our questions become as we learn more about what kinds of questions are most appropriate are appropriate and how to open up the broader the conversation in a broader way that goes beyond yes, no, or short answers. There's a method called the teach back method that many of you may have heard of. And this is a really important method in multicultural um, training and working with patients and providers. Very briefly, the teach back method um, really uh, involves a, a provider, for example, a physician, nurse, or social worker, you know, explaining perhaps more about the, um, the current status of a, of a patient's health, let's say, where there are health care changes, and asking the person, you know, what do you understand about your condi condition? Um, can you explain back to me what you've heard? I just want to make sure that you understand that I've been really clear. So this engages in a process of give and take where you can make sure that the person really has understood what you're saying and, um, and understands some of the key points. Another method is called the LEARN model of cultural communication. And uh, this was developed at Stanford quite some years ago. The LEARN model uh, is an acronym, and it's a five-step process. The L is to listen to the person's uh, perspective that you're speaking with. Uh, the E is to explain and share perspectives. Um, A is for acknowledging differences and similarities between perspectives. R is recommending a united plan. And N is negotiating that plan. There is a whole curriculum out on LEARN. Um, Many states, most states, I think, have uh, practices involving this available, and so there are many uh, resources available. Um, others of you may have heard something called the RESPECT model, and this is similar, uh, but just with different um, cues. Again, the basis of cultural humility is that we are always learning, and about seven months ago, the Twin Cities Medical Society, in honoring choices, received a, um, a national grant to produce three culturally sensitive videos 
in the languages of uh, Somalis, in the languages of Hmong persons, and in the languages of the Kino Hispanics. And a very uh, um, a very carefully designed planning team was put together to involve leaders, religious leaders, community members, community health workers, a variety of other people to be part of the creation of these videos. The uh, intent and the whole design of these videos was that they were developed by the community and for the communities that were targeted. They weren't developed by outside specialists. They weren't by, developed by outside people who had studied a lot and been uh, theoretically knowledgeable. They were developed by the communities and for the communities. And this video series is called Voices of Advanced Care Planning. It's available on the www.honoringchoices.org website. To view this, there are a variety of options. Um, for example, in the uh, Hmong, Seven to eight minute video is done entirely in Hmong. There are caption options so that Hmong uh, listeners and Hmong viewers can also turn on the Hmong caption and can read along in Hmong and follow it. For those of us that don't speak Hmong, you can simply turn on the English caption and follow it, or you can follow it without captions. But this is a series you will not find uh, in, in English by English spoken people. Um, because it's about Hmong traditions, it's about Hmong cultures, and it's about the Hmong language. And so that was kept intact. Um, the same thing occurred with the Somali video. Um, it is completely in Somali, and it has Somali sub subtitles or captions, and you can also turn on English captions to follow along. And likewise, with the Spanish version, uh, it's entirely in Spanish with English subtitles. And we are very happy to have learned, and um, this was a very tension move on our part, was our goal also was that this could be used by providers and healthcare systems and clinics to use as a staff development training for English speakers. And what we found through focus groups and a whole variety of community presentations is that English speakers are learning a great deal from listening to the three videos um, with the English captions. Um, not only viewing each one individually, and they were developed to be independent, but we're finding out that physicians, nurses, case managers, others um, are learning an incredible amount of, uh, of gaining sensitivity and learning a great deal from watching the three of them together. They were designed separately, so there are, there are different approaches. They're filmed differently. They have a different cast of characters, and they were simply done um, in about seven to eight minute segments to bring up what was essential within these three communities about advanced care planning. So if you haven't seen them yet, I hope you'll go to our website uh, and watch them. They're also available uh, as a hard copy DVD and you can contact Honor and Choices Minnesota to purchase your own um, DVD copy as well. Some of these principles that I'm going to explain now are, are broader general principles, but all of these uh, pieces were very intentionally clued in the crafting and the making of the videos. So as you're um, reflecting on the videos for those of you who've watched them, for those of you that haven't, the things that we're going to be talking about the rest of this webinar are key parts that went into all of the videos and the videos wouldn't be what they are now without them. So one is certainly including gender, gender and decision making uh, in looking at advanced care planning and how to begin that process. Uh, women have different roles than men. Um, in uh, several of the cultures that we worked at, traditionally in the Hmong culture and the Hispanic culture, uh, men have a very, very prominent role um, as the leaders. Um, in both cultures, this role is changing. While there's still uh, often uh, leaders and decision makers, the role of women has really changed since coming to the United States and other cultures where women have a, a very different role. So gender is very important when um, talking with families and 
and, and individuals about decision making. Agent communication is really important in the um, three groups that we explored with the videos. Age is very powerful. Uh, in all of these cultures, uh, elders are highly respected. Um, I hope personally in the United States that this begins to change uh, much more soon, but I think for those of you that have traveled in uh, non-Western countries, many, many of you have learned that the role uh, of elders is very different and the respect given to elders is pronounced and powerful. And the same way in, um, in aging communication, um, it has very strong implications. Education has an uh, important impact. Um, many of us have been trained to speak medical ease. Um, we often forget that the people that we're speaking to do not know technical medical terms. Um, we need to make sure that we're speaking common English, that we're speaking a language that can be understood. Um, for people uh, speaking the same language who have a, a master's degree and for those of for those people who have never received a formal education but speak English, you know, vocabulary is quite important. So always be sure, uh, be sure to adjust your literacy level and to really, you know, listen very carefully so that you understand the, the level of, piece of language that people are, are speaking. Acculturation is also very uh, important. Hmong who came here in the 1970s were the pioneers. Today we have three or four generations who are hip-hop artists, who are rap artists, who are involved in theater, uh, who are, have experienced great acculturation, and who see themselves as Americans, um, often more than even as Hmong Americans. So it's really important to understand who you're talking with, um, what level of acculturation or adapt adaptation of the customs they've been involved in um, and where that lies. Other considerations include uh, migration, if, other, if individuals have lived in other countries before coming to the United States, if they have other religions other than dominant religions. Um, these are the things that an open-ended question will really bring up when exploring uh, customs and you know, asking people, tell me more about yourself. What, what is important to you? Uh, tell me more about your family. Uh, where do you live now? What, what religious or uh, beliefs or holidays are most important to you? So there's a variety of other considerations that are powerful. Again, storytelling is at the basis of cross-cultural communication, and there are so many available. When you're listening to the Voices of Death care planning videos, you'll hear many of them in the documentaries on the Honoring Choices website, all seven of the 30-minute videos have very complex stories of people of all ages and backgrounds. And again, on the WWW Honoring Choices website, there are over 100, over 700 stories that inform us. You know, I think the more that as individuals who begin to share our stories um, and learn, there are very common stories, um, and there are ones that are not so common. Some stories that are a part of the background advanced care planning and important to recognize are that one within uh, much of the Hmong culture uh, with surgery is it's very important that um, either metal is not inserted or that before death the metal, or after death the metal is, is taken out. This is a really important piece before burial. Um, tradition is someone that is buried with metal it affects their reincarnation, it affects how they're going to come back in, in later life. Um, uh, this is part of traditions and stories. Uh, another really important, and, and stories are, um, are 
are sometimes what we tell ourselves as, as well. Um, so I just want to be clear about that, that in uh, Latino-Hispanic culture, there have been, as with all of us, many miracles that are occurring. Many people with terminal illness have recovered or gone beyond their illness, much of uh, that through physicians' surprise as well. So there's a great belief in, in miracles and uh, the power of miracles, and this is universal as well. Um, so it's important to understand people's stories you know, in order to gain more information on their values. Again, storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world today from Robert McKee, and also the universe is made of stories, not atoms. Because all good storytellers know that from Mario Angelo on and others, and the more that we can engage our patients in telling their stories about what's important in advanced care planning, um, the more that we can learn. I just want to briefly talk about some tools and resources for advanced care planning. Uh, again, I talked about the multicultural videos, patient education materials. I want you to know there's also healthcare directives on the Honoring Choices website that are in five languages. These are in English, Somali, Hmong, Spanish, and Russian. There are also patient information guides that you can use with your patients and families. Many of these tools, including the new videos, are being used one-on-one -on -one in patient and family education sessions. They're being displayed and shown in, in clinics and waiting rooms. For example, the Hmong video is being used at uh, East Side Clinic uh, in St. Paul so that Hmong elders and family members, while they're waiting for visits with their Hmong physicians, can watch them and discuss them. As I mentioned earlier, they're being used in, in staff training and education sessions and workshops. There are also person and family centered resources. Um, pause just for a moment. The Voices of the Dance Trip Planning video is one of these. Um, for example, in the video you will hear um, people talking about a phrase, for example, when you reach 120 years. This is a common Hmong perspective to talk about death and dying. Um, this Hmong uh, person and their family would be insulting in to bring up death or dying. It's a very blatant uh, term. It, invite something bad to happen to families, it's offensive. So a much better Hmong term to use is when you've reached 120 years. And what this means with most Hmong individuals is that that is a full life, that a person has lived a complete life and a full life. So um, many Western providers have learned this over the years, and when speaking with Hmong elders and others, they're you know, bringing up a conversation when you reach 120 years. Within person and family centered resources, you know, respect for elders is again very important. Elders are always included in the conversation. Um, they're given respect. Um, they're, they're listened to, they're asked their opinion. One wouldn't say, um, uh, you know, what, what does your grandmother want? What does your grandfather want? What do you think your aunt would prefer? You know, elders are very esteemed and they have strong personal opinions and it's really important to follow them. Another thing that we often hear uh, with many people, uh, including English speakers, is that, you know, just ask my children. My children will make decisions for me when the time comes. And what we've learned universally is that most adult children simply don't know what their family members want. And this is important to remember for, for all. And it's really important to begin that conversation with elders when they bring this up that, you know, my daughter will know 
Um, my son will know by simply saying, you know, it's a very odd thing that often we think our family members do, but what we're finding is that they don't. And um, they're very anxious and have often no idea what their loved ones really want. So we've learned to really invite them in the conversation um, to bring the adult children in so that they know what you want. It's not simply to ask them. One other thing that we've learned from um, intense family and, and individual work is that people really value advanced care planning because it's one of the best ways you can, that they can protect their interests. Um, they, they find that that's how they can explore what they want and don't want. Of all the reasons for advanced care planning that we've explored, the most common and most powerful reason that we've been given is that it's the best way to protect your interests. In many of our health systems, there are advanced care planning facilitators that can provide one-on-one -on -one personalized care. Facilitators should always be using interpreters if there are language gaps. Most health systems have either in-person or telephone-based interpreters through online services. It's really important to establish this way ahead of time to bring the interpreter in on the conversation. The interpreters can really help guide the conversation and explain it in much greater detail that's needed. Interpreters aren't simply just taking English and translating it into another language. They're really interpreting meaning. So um, the, power, the power of using trained medical interpreters can't be um, minimized. In broader community settings, we've learned a variety of things as well. And for example, within the Somali community, while physicians have great esteem and have great respect, physicians are not the ultimate determinators of an illness and of when a person will live and die. Um, Allah or God has a much greater power and will determine that. And it's often really important to recognize that and the humility that comes with it. Many physicians are very frank and candid about this and say, you know, as your physician, my guess is that your prospect, your life may look like this in the next year. You can expect these kinds of things, but only Allah will know. And I'm just advising on what you might expect, but you know, prayer and many other things are very important. I'm just one part of your life. So acknowledging the place of medicine uh, as a smaller piece of a much larger universe is, is really important. Another example that often happens in the Somali community is a discussion of the role of the Quran in advanced care planning. And there's a section of the Quran that goes uh, like this when it's translated into English that no one should go to sleep for three consecutive nights unless their will is written. And often among imams or others, this is brought up so that individuals can see that there's a strong correlation between advanced care planning and the Quran and as far as the importance of knowing your wishes, of guiding your family, of not creating stress in your family, of not separating families or creating situations that would be very disruptive. So um, the importance of, of something being written down is very important. Somali um, language is, is a really important oral language. Uh, there have been Somali poets and writers and mathematicians for thousands of years. So this is a, um, a well-established tradition in Somalia. Also in the Quran are some important aspects of how it is one to, um, how important it is for one to prevent harm and suffering. So this can be brought in on advanced care planning conversations as well. One other current theme that many providers uh, bring up is that Western medicine does not solve everything. Um, 
and there are many things that can't heal and many things that can't solve. In many countries, people look at Western medicine or, or the United States as this golden country where things are solved quickly, where people agree, where there's endless opportunity, uh, kind of a bootstrap mentality. And this is something that in working with advanced care planning, we work really hard in, in explaining that, that uh, Western medicine cannot solve everything. We have medications, we have procedures, but much of uh, uh, medicine is an art and much of it is beyond our control. So um, faith, humility, values, um, other kinds of healers, such as traditional healers, medicine men, they also have strong roles to play in Western medicine. Another important thing is that talking about your wishes takes time, particularly in a multicultural setting. The idea of talking with your family about what you want at the end of your life when you are currently healthy is a really odd concept for many, many people. And uh, explaining that this uh, is becoming a, a practice and that this is a norm in the United States takes much time and much patience and much repetition. So often advanced care planning conversations that are on a very fundamental basis may take uh, weeks or months or even a year to accomplish. It's really important that advanced care planning conversations begin uh, in a trusted way with a trusted provider not with someone who they've met for the very first time that they have no relationship or, uh, or trust in. When, unfortunately, this does happen, often rumors or often it goes back to the community, do not go to such and such a hospital. Um, someone I hardly knew, hardly knew, talked to me about my death and dying. I'm well, I'm healthy. I don't know what they had in mind. It was puzzling. I think uh, our family went to a different hospital. Uh, they're approaching it much more, and in fact, they didn't even approach it with us until after the physician got to know us much better. We're so much more comfortable there. So this is something to really establish trust about and, and take over time. Just briefly within Latino and Hispanic cultures, um, a message that physicians will also often talk with reverends or a priest or family members is a more of a Western medicine concept, but um, talk, we try to instill that in more in Western society as a physician that I believe in talking about death doesn't make it happen that talking about death we found is really important for individuals. It, um, it helps individuals to understand their diagnosis. It helps under individuals understand that they may be getting sicker. It helps family members understand that there may be a, a decline in health. There were things, sometimes that physicians call them a conspiracy of silence, where between say an adult young woman and her mother, a young woman wants to protect her mother from, let's say, a cancer diagnosis or from mental health repercussions, so she wouldn't talk with her mother about a very similar diagnosis. And there are conspiracies you know, of silence, as they're called, but there are ways to overcome this through real gradual work and talking and, and using the social workers and community health workers um, so that people can be clued in on their medical prognosis and their family members know. One physician that I work with always says, you know, as a physician, I hope for the best and I prepare for the worst. And I try to do that in all of my work with my families, too. For all people, um, family involvement is important. Even though a healthcare agent or a healthcare proxy may be chosen and selected as the, the voice of the person in, in helping communicate, it's important that the family is involved in all conversations. 
many people choose as their best care planning agent someone that is not a family member. Sometimes they have a best friend going back to childhood who they really trust and who can talk with them and talk with providers in a very tense situation and communicate really well. Individuals sometimes know that their family members can't. They get very nervous or experience great anxiety. So it's really important to bring your advanced care planning agent and your family members together and sometimes explain that, you know, I really want um, Miguel, my best friend from, um, from grade school, from primary care, um, from primary school to be my health care agent. You know, Miguel, he's been part of our family. Um, he's very cool, headed in many situations. He's physical therapist by trade, and I really trust him uh, as a profession to communicate within our family. Multicultural networks and associations are often really important on a community basis. Some examples of networks and associations that have played a powerful role in advanced care planning in Minnesota are the Mom Health Care, professionals. Um, they are a group of Hmong providers of all different backgrounds who have learned and been trained in advanced care planning and can carry this message within their community. Another uh, example of association is the uh, Minnesota Peer Network, and it's a network of community health care workers who've been trained in advanced care planning who can take this message to their colleagues, to their staff in different healthcare systems and hospitals and can advocate for the patients and families. Faith and spiritual organizations have a huge role. As you know, many people prefer to speak to the, talk to speak about advanced care planning outside of the healthcare setting. They may have had a very distrustful relationship in the past with Western medicine. They have made it have been considered an experimental group, such as African Americans with the Tuskegee experiment um, many years ago, um, so that breaches in trust have, have taken place. Many people are much more comfortable talking about advanced care planning in a faith or other setting. And so uh, we work very closely with mosques, with synagogues, with Hindu temples, with uh, churches and other kinds of congregations to talk about advanced care planning in adult education groups, um, in working with the uh, spiritual leaders, sometimes there will be a message from the, um, from the pulpit or from the, um, from the ark or from the center stage where that occurs. There's many different ways and places to begin advanced care planning. Colleges and universities are also very interested in this. Physicians have not been trained well in beginning advanced care planning conversations. Medical curriculum in the United States has not been well designed to talk about death and dying. And we're hearing both from medical students and from residents as well as faculty and many medical students about the need for a new curricula, about the need for new ways to introduce advanced care planning, both in, in medical school, in nursing school, social work, you know, across disciplinary, um, across disciplinary disciplines, more and more mortuary science departments at universities are discussing advanced care planning because um, individuals in the mortuary science field want the knowledge to be able to talk about wishes and desires with family members so that they're uh, knowledgeable and can help be a guide as well. At state and local conferences and seminars, I'm sure many of you are seeing more and more sessions on advanced care planning. Um, in the weeks ahead, uh, Honoring Choices is speaking to college and communities, uh, university communities, to students and faculty at a, uh, through a network called the Campus Compact, introducing advanced care planning help and advanced care planning conversations there. Uh, we're speaking at public health conferences throughout the state, multicultural conferences, um, 
We're speaking to uh, lawyers and attorneys at legal uh, events so that they understand more about the resources that are available on advanced care planning and the kind of video tools and others that are occurring. So again, we've learned that one size simply does not fit all, um, both with resources and tools as well. And that's why on our website you can find a whole variety of resources that are customized for the audiences that you're working with. Cultural humility, again, has no end point, and uh, we never arrive at a place where, where we are done learning. And here's a, a slide of a black belt person in karate um, and someone who's just learning um, saying, no kidding, um, you really have a black belt in, in humility. And, uh, you know, we're looking at a much leveler playing field than in the past. I think um, most communities realize the extraordinary challenges that they experience due to very different kinds of beliefs that are growing, um, very different kinds of backgrounds, and culture humility is a huge, um, a huge challenge and a huge task before all of us, again, that is um, limitless and that goes on all of our lives. As healthcare providers and, and caregivers, we believe that better is possible um, in being marshaled by Dr. Atul Gawande. Mr. Gawande writes, you know, it does not take genius. It takes diligence. It takes moral clarity to begin advanced care planning conversations. It takes ingenuity and creativity. And above all, it takes a willingness to try. And again, this is from uh, Dr. Blondie's book, Being Mortal, um, written in 2015, earlier this year. So as we're beginning advanced care planning with patients, with clients, um, in a clinic setting, in a home setting, uh, in care visits, on a community level as we're being invited to speak and work with all kinds of people, what do we help to gain? Some of the important things is that we hope to, again, recognize as we're working with people, power imbalances where, where none ought to exist. We want to remember that each individual is an expert in his or her own life. We want to begin collaborating and learning from each other for the best possible outcomes, for not our outcomes as necessarily a, a, someone who is scholarly or learned in, in medicine or healthcare, but what is considered the best outcome for that patient and for their family. We want to acknowledge that while a provider uh, may hold much power in scientific knowledge, that an individual holds the power in their own personal history and preferences. Someone would like to learn much more about this and the process of um, how people have been treated in the past and much of the, the current health care system, a very good national resource is unequal treatment um, that's available to the Institute of uh, Institute Sun Health. I want to open this up now to many of you uh, to share your own thoughts and situations, um, your reflections for those of you who had a chance to watch the Voices of Advanced Care Planning video. What kinds of things did you learn about how being a man or a woman, the role of gender, impacts on how you begin a conversation? Is it appropriate for a, a woman to be have an advanced for signing conversation and begin this with a elder um, who is male of another society. Might it be better to have the same gender uh, person to begin that conversation or the same age, the closer age group to begin that conversation? So I know you all have a wealth of experiences uh, and I just want to open this up uh, to all of you. The floor is now open for questions. If you have a question, seven. Again, that was the number seven or the letter Q on your telephone keypad. 
questions will be taken in the order they were received. And if at any point your question has been answered, you may press 7 or Q again to disable your request. If you are using a speakerphone, we ask that while posing your question, you pick up your handset to provide favorable sound quality. Please hold while we wait for the first question. While we're waiting, you know, I have a couple of questions for you, Barbara. <laughs> so one thing I was wondering is that for the cultures that you mentioned, is advanced care planning a new idea for them? Or, you know, since some of them are immigrants to America, or is that something they've done in their home country but maybe in a different way? You know, you know actually it varies quite a bit. For many people, this is a very strange conversation, one they have never before had before, one that they would feel very uncomfortable about bringing um, back to their family members. I know in a, um, a recent conversation that I had with a Somali woman, um, individual, uh, if I brought this back to my family, they would think I have a mental health issue. They would think I am unstable. This is something that um, we've not talked about as a family before. We've not involved our, our adult children in. This is a private con conversation between a husband and, and a wife or a, a mother and a daughter and including cousins in or others um, might be a very strange notion. Um, in other cultures, it may have uh, occurred that in a different way with people approaching this more from a, a property or um, my home or my um, special possession of uh, who would is, who is this go to often brings up uh, the question of health care wishes. So it really, there's a whole variety of, of prototypes and, and one really important question that is important for all of us to ask when we're working with someone is, have you ever had this conversation before? Um, has this ever occurred in your, in your home? Have you ever talked to this about anyone else? And I think with both this and in between cultures, you'll find it just a great variety. Great, thank you. Again, if you do have a question, please press the number 7 on your telephone keypad. This year, it appears we have no questions at this time. Okay, well, I have one more here. <laughs> and if anybody else in the room has a question, I'll have you just come up here and so the folks uh, can hear it online. Uh, so here's my question. You talked about having medical interpreters speak for people that don't speak English. So I'm wondering about the training that medical interpreters have about advanced care planning. Is that part of their curriculum? What an excellent question. Currently, it is not, and that presents great barriers. Um, what Honoring Choices has tried to do is work um, much more closely with the directors and interpreters' services in a variety of hospital settings uh, because interpreters have not uh, received training for the most part in advanced care planning, and they are often very uncomfortable bringing up the um, conversation about death and dying to the person they're interpreting for. Um, it's often not, not their role. They may, particularly if it's a younger interpreter speaking with elders, about death and dying would not be appropriate. And so uh, it, it puts interpreters in a very precarious position too. And so this is one way that we're working more and more with directors of interpreter services to try to have in services and workshops to interpreters to talk about a variety of things. One, that advanced care planning now is becoming a norm in the United States. It happens among healthy people. It happens for people, all people who are 18 years of age and older. It isn't for something that someone is elderly or has a terminal illness. It's occurring within healthy families among healthy individuals. And so this is a norm and so that um, 
and again, the interpreters know that they can, in their explanation, say, you know, you may not have heard of the term advanced care planning or talking about your health care wishes if you couldn't speak. But this is something new in the United States medicine, and it's become important because there's so many health care interventions that we find sometimes people don't want if they're really ill. And we're finding that sometimes individuals don't get the care that they want and get care that, that they wouldn't want um, both for themselves and their loved ones. So this is why we're being so active in really beginning this kind of conversation. So interpreters need a great deal of training on this. Um, the more that you can involve your own interpreters and your interpreter directors in this conversation and training, the better you uh, better possible. Um, if you're working with national interpreter service agencies, you know, as a client, you can certainly approach this conversation and ask if there's any way you could do some long distance training with, uh, with interpreters, if there's a way you could make this happen. Uh, in the Twin Cities, we're doing uh, more and more of this. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be having a director of interpreter services and a variety of interpreters and community health workers come in to a group of uh, healthcare leaders to really talk much more about how to effectively use interpreters because many physicians and others really don't know how to do this um, well. Often uh, providers speak to the interpreter and look at the interpreter throughout the communication. Um, you know, that is a very poor practice. You should always be looking and addressing all your questions, you know, to, the, to your patients. There's a variety of other, you know, practices as well, including the need to talk to with an interpreter before the actual patient conversation so that you can brief the interpreter in what's going to be said, um, learn about what would be appropriate for this conversation, what the interpreter would recommend, and then also ask the interpreter if they can stay for a couple minutes after the conversation for a debriefing. And that's really important just so that the provider can get a sense for, from the interpreter on some of the family's concerns because there will be a great deal of conversation happening in another language between the family and the interpreter. And the interpreter may not be interpreting every single thing you know, that is being said. Um, often it's very complicated to take what's being said in another language and convert it into English. Um, it's often very clumsy or it simply doesn't make sense. And, um, so that debriefing time is really important so the physician can understand the, you know, the ease or unease um, of, of families. The interpreter can also suggest, you know, I think we need to go much slower with this. I think we need to give, um, not bring this up for maybe a month or two until we, the family has a chance to talk more about this. Um, I've learned that the eldest son uh, has not been included in conversations really important the next time we meet and talk for um, the eldest son to be included in a conference call or in Skype. So that kind of debriefing is really important so that the healthcare professional can really learn a lot about the care from the interpreter as well. Hi, this is Nicole Fitch. Go back a question regarding just the interpreter part of that. Do you have a list um, of interpreters you know, on, the, on the website or anything like that that where we can um, get a hold of somebody? Because I know we, I can think of a specific time when we had a hard time finding someone to help us. So is there a list of interpreters that they recommend at all on the website? You know, um, for all individuals who, who live in Minnesota, my best recommendation is to go on Google and to Google um, interpreters of healthcare systems or interpreters of hospitals because um, a list of uh, the interpreter services sometimes change and services that were in business and were very active several years ago may not be now. Um, there is a core list of some interpreter agencies that are um, have really outstanding services and very good reputations. You know, I can't endorse or not endorse anyone, 
Um, but I think in looking at um, Google Sites and if you look at the hospital that has or a health system that has an interpreter services department, if you can call the director of interpreter services and simply ask, you know, I, I'm looking for a, a new or a interpreter service agency, can you recommend, you know, one or several that I might go to that you have really good luck on uh, or luck with both um, for being able to be on site with the interpreter services and one that has telephone interpreter services available. Um, you know, I just want to be clear that while Google can give you an initial list, it's really good to talk with someone um, about who they might recommend. So if you work with nurses or other people that work a lot with interpreters, it's always a great idea to say, you know, would you recommend a, um, a company that really has reliable services that you've had really good experiences with? You know, there are just a lot of them available, and you need to. Um, some organizations or some hospitals use several um, because they need, you know, a variety available for different times of the day and in different settings. So often they will work with two or three different interpreter service agencies so that they you don't have any trouble um, accessing at different times of the day or at different times of night. Good question. What if you uh, can't find an, an interpreter and um, a family member is available? Um, should you be using a family member as an interpreter? Uh, in the room that, I am, that I'm in with Janelle, there's some people shaking their heads. Maybe they want to share their wisdom about that. Why, what's wrong with using uh, a, a teenager who knows his, his or her parents really well or a, a sister who knows their family well? Why shouldn't they be served as an interpreter, you know, if you're in, a, in an important or serious condition? Isn't someone better than no one? Their opinion is based on how they feel probably because it's far too personal for them to be able to display and communicate how maybe their loved one is actually feeling or wanting. You know, that's my opinion. Close to home. It's a really good perspective. It's so true. And often, as you know, family members may not understand medical terminology or may not understand a diagnosis and may have. Uh, what they believe is knowledge based on a television program or something that they've heard in the community um, that may have been misinterpreted. So even uh, for an educated uh, adult, a quote-unquote educated adult, um, their best knowledge may be based on something that is far from you know, the truth. So it's really important to get that trained person in who is certified and has gone through a rigorous process of learning how to communicate and, uh, and who understands medical terminology and anatomy and can explain things really clearly in lay um, language. Another really important reason not to use a teenager or a child as an interpreter it puts that person in a really vulnerable position. Um, you know, that individual um, may be very frightened about their loved one's condition, uh, doesn't understand exactly what's going on um, or the severity of it, and um, may uh, feel that they have some help, you know, personal responsibility now in the care of that person because they are acting as an intermediary. It really is a strong disservice um, to any to any child or any young person or really any family member to put them in a position to uh, translate or interpret really important conditions um, that goes beyond their knowledge or, or scope of comfort. Are there any other questions out there, Laura? At this time, we have no questions on the line. However, please press the number 7 or the letter Q on your telephone keypad should you have a question. It appears we have no questions at this time.
Okay. Well, we will conclude this part of the, the meeting today. I want to thank you, Barbara, so much for coming and presenting the great information. Um, I learned a lot, and it looks like the people in the room have learned a lot as well. So thanks so much.